So I was just saying, it's great to be with you this morning, and thanks to Heather for reading her passage for this morning, and thanks to our youth worship for leading us. It's always a joy to have them here, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, why don't we open in prayer together before we jump into our passage this morning? Let's pray. God, it's such a gift to be able to open your word. We know that every time we come to your word, we get to meet with you, God. We're so thankful for that. And this morning, as we unpack another passage from Galatians, we pray that you would help us to just block out any distractions, anything that's weighing on our hearts and our minds. And would you help us to just come open to what you have to teach us this morning? Would you meet with us in a personal way? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our son at the moment is on a mission to grow an apple tree in our backyard. So every time I cut an apple, he reminds me not to cut the seeds in half. So he's actually collecting these apple seeds uh, in a little cup on our, our windowsill in our kitchen. And the other day, actually, he went out to our backyard and he actually started watering these apple seeds. He is determined that they're going to grow some fruit. So some of them may have gotten mixed up with some pear seeds in the process, but we'll see what happens. God's creative, right? But scripture speaks of another kind of fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Now, many of us grew up hearing all about the fruit of the spirit, but this obviously isn't the kind of fruit that you hold in your hand, that you, that you plant, that you water. It's a kind of spiritual fruit that comes through relationship with Jesus. So we're going to dig a little deeper this morning into what, what exactly is the fruit of the Spirit. So as Heather just read from our passage this morning, the fruit of the Spirit, those are some pretty admirable qualities, aren't they? I think it's pretty safe to say that we would all aspire to be more peaceful, gracious, loving, kind, all those things. But I think it's easy to view the fruit of the Spirit as a list of attributes, you know, characteristics outside of ourselves that we try to attain, life goals, so to speak. But this is where it's so easy, I think, to slip into a sort of works mentality. Now, we know just from reading Paul's letter to the Galatians over the past few months that this is what the Galatian church was prone to doing, trying to earn God's favor and blessing by following religious laws, expectations, now, maybe we don't practice circumcision or, or follow dietary laws, but let me ask us, how often do we try to meet God's standards in and of our own strength? How often do we live like the work of Jesus just isn't enough? See, the fruit of the Spirit, it's not a checklist for us to follow. It's not a standard to meet. So, so what does Paul actually mean when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit? Well, first of all, the fruit of the Spirit, it's a sign of the Holy Spirit's presence in us. It's a natural outworking of his presence in us. It's evidence of him, right? See, there's kind of an astounding truth underlying this passage. And if we get caught up in this list, it's really easy to miss that. And that's when we commit our lives to Jesus. We receive forgiveness, of course. We're justified before God. But we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Can you just pause and think about that for a second? As Jesus' followers, the Spirit of God is in us. Do we understand what a gift that is? But as well, his presence in us should be evident to those around us, 
That's where the fruit of the Spirit comes in. See, the Holy Spirit produces fruit in us that reflects his nature. You ever known someone that just exuded peace, patience, kindness? Ever kind of wanted to be like them? Maybe we've all experienced that. Well, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit in someone. It's just part of their being. Now, this is a common theme in Scripture. So Jesus, for example, connected this spiritual truth to the process of a tree bearing fruit. He taught that just as a tree can be recognized by the fruit that it bears, the presence of the Spirit in us can be recognized by our fruit. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 16. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears fruit, bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears fruit bad fruit. See, that's a scientific and and a spiritual truth right there. Healthy seed, healthy fruit. When the Holy Spirit is in us, his good fruit should be evident in us. So the fruit of the Spirit, it's a direct result of the Holy Spirit in us, but it's also a result of his work in us. The fruit of the Spirit is a sign of the Holy Spirit's work in us. So what do I mean by that? See, the Holy Spirit, he transforms us more and more into the likeness of Christ so that outwardly we reflect him. That process is called sanctification. See, we're forgiven. We're spiritually reborn. We're restored to right standing with God, right, through Jesus, as we've talked about throughout this series. But also, the Holy Spirit works in us so that more and more we reflect that right standing love how one author, Miller Erickson, the name is, puts it. He says, sanctification is the continued transformation of moral and spiritual character so that the life of the believer actually comes to mirror the standing which he or she already has in God's sight. See, we're given that right standing, and then we reflect it. it it's really a win-win situation for us. So, Our two younger children, they measure everything according to what they call a snuggly meter. So you'll be glad to know since moving to PCC, now they've defined PCC as a snuggly church. So you've all reached snuggly status. So the meaning of being snuggly is basically you show the fruit of the spirit. Love, patience, kindness, all those things. There have been a few times where apparently my snuggly meter has reached zero. So that's my confession for this morning. But as helpful as it is to have a snuggly meter or any kind of meter, really, thank goodness we don't have to rely on checklists to change our behavior. Because at the end of the day, it's through his work in us that our nature and by default, our behavior begins to more and more reflect his. So 2 Corinthians 3.18, this is one of my favorite verses says, we are being transformed into his image. It's the image of Christ. With ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. See, we're forgiven, we're justified, and we're made new. But this inner transformation doesn't come from striving, but from abiding in him. The fruit of the Spirit doesn't come from striving, but from abiding. Now, again, this is an easy mistake to make. Trying to manufacture the fruit of the Spirit in us instead of allowing him to do his work in us. It's not such a mu- so much about our work, as we've heard throughout this series. It's about his work. And that's an important distinction. See, if, if I were to give those apple seeds on my windowsill at the moment a pep talk, You know, encourage them to grow some papaya instead. What are the chances that would happen? Well, zero, right? Because fruit is a product of a plant's nature. No matter how much I care for that plant, no matter how much I will it to grow something else, apples can be kind of boring, right? It's not going to happen. 
It's not going to happen. And it's the same with the fruit of the Spirit. Our behavior is a direct result of his work as we're shaped by the inner working of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen through striving. It's the direct result of a supernatural process as he transforms us. Love how the prophet Jeremiah puts this. This is hundreds of years before Christ, looking forward to a time when God's spirit would transform the hearts of his people. In Ezekiel 36, God speaking, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Aren't you thankful for that? I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. There it is. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. See, that's the work of the, sp the spirit. He transforms us. Really, we could say on a, on a spiritually cellular level, and what results is the fruit of the spirit. But what is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in us. I mean, we can't talk about this passage without talking about that. What is the evidence of it? And we could spend a few weeks really talking about this list. But I think for this morning's purposes, let's just look at the first example. Example given of the Spirit's work in us, love. Why focus on love? Well, first of all, love is foundational to God's character. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Jesus says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. That's how central love is to God's character. Everything God does, from creation to the cross and everything in between, it's out of love. But also, love is foundational to everything that's listed here in Galatians 5, 22, 23. There's a famous passage known as the love passage. 1 Corinthians 13 says this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. Is not proud. Does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. See, God is wholly loving. And when his love is evident in us, that love will inevitably bleed out in, into other areas of our lives, ways we never thought possible. We may find ourselves prior prioritizing peace, in our relationships with others, even when they annoy us. Starting to give more freely of, of our time and our resources. Approaching disagreements with more gentleness. You know, controlling our tongues when we know we have the, the best comeback and it's just sitting on the edge of our tongues. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So all that comes out of love. It's a telltale sign of the Holy Spirit's work in us goes without saying love it's not easy is it love is not easy i think love it's a word we throw around a lot so i love chocolate and if you've ever been to one of our women's events at the church you'll find out pretty quickly that i love chocolate we i don't think we've ever had an event where we have not had chocolate in some some sort of form i love coffee i love tea anything with caffeine as a mom I love books. If you look at my phone, you'll see a list of books that I still have to read. But this isn't the kind of love that Paul's talking about here. He's not even referring to romantic affection. The kind of love Paul is referring to, in the Greek language, it's known as agape. It's, it's a kind of love that's more than just emotion. It's a kind of love that speaks of intention, deliberate action, sacrifice, loving others when it's just not easy. Many of us have been there. One author describes agape love as a principle by which we deliberately live. That's a whole other level of love. The kind of love we, you know, we commit to in our marriage vows, in sickness and in health, 
Ever think about that? Forsaking all others till death do us part. That's love. It's a kind of love that's not easy. But with the Holy Spirit's help, it's possible. So the Holy Spirit, he produces fruit in us, beginning with love. But what's our responsibility in this? Do we have a responsibility in this? Well, yeah, we do. Our responsibility is simply this, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he transforms us from the inside out, to cooperate with him. So what does that even look like? Well, in order to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, first, we need to receive him. And we do that by, by first turning to Jesus and admitting our dependence on him. And when we turn to faith in Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And really, truly, he is a gift. In Acts 2, 28, speaking to the crowds at Pentecost, Peter says to them, repent, meaning turn away from your former lives, turn in faith to Jesus, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, faith in Jesus, it's a prerequisite to receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, maybe you haven't taken that step, turn your life over to Jesus and, and received his spirit. Maybe your idea of living a good life is, is just trying harder. And if so, I would love to chat with you about that. But regardless of what we may have been told, faith in Jesus, it isn't about following a set of rules or meeting a set of expectations. It's about following a person. And the decision to follow that person is life-changing. But also... In order to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we need to spend time with them. Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we take those words to heart? Only time in his presence will produce fruit a given. So abiding rather than striving is something I'm continually working on. So my default posture tends to be striving. Any other perfectionists out there? Yeah, that's me sometimes. So often when I come to prayer and, and I ask for his fruit to be evident in me, sometimes I don't sit long enough with him to be changed by him. It's a continual process for me. I'm working on that. But I remember one morning having a time of prayer, and I had a very clear image in my mind as I was praying. And in the, in the passage, or in the image in my head, I saw myself walking up a very long set of stairs. Now, to be clear, this was not a theological picture of prayer. This was just how I was viewing prayer at that time in my life. So here I was, all the way up those stairs, bringing my prayers to Jesus. And when I reached the top, I could see it just in the image in my head. I could see myself giving him my prayer requests and then receiving them from him. And then I saw myself turning right down, turning around and heading right down those flight of stairs. Like it was time to go. I'd done my business with Jesus, people to go places to see, you know. Started heading down those stairs. But then when I looked again, I noticed something that stopped me in my tracks. I saw Jesus walking behind me all the way down those stairs. But see, what hit me in that, in that moment, and, and as I prayed about it, was so often we come to him and we ask for peace, patience, kindness, all those things we need for that day, for that week, for that month, for that year. And he gives us his presence. He gives us himself. And that's so much better. What's our default posture as followers of Jesus? Is it striving or is it abiding? How much time do we dedicate to intentionally sitting with the Holy Spirit, asking him to speak to us, share his heart with us, change us? There's a well-known Christian author, survivor of the Holocaust, actually, Corrie Ten Boom. She once said, when we are powerless to do a thing, 
it is a great joy that we can come and step inside the ability of Jesus. How often do we step inside the ability of Jesus? Psalm 139, 23, 24, David prays, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me. Know me. Lead me. I feel like I need to circle those words in my Bible sometimes. All of these words, see, they're relationship-based, and they're God-centered. Change happens through relationship with him and through his work in us. Relationship leads to fruit, not vice versa. But as well, in order to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we need to listen to him and respond to his promptings. Whether he's convicting of something, us of something we've read in his word or whether he's speaking to us in our hearts, something he's put on our hearts. Now, for those of us who are follow followers of Jesus, this is really hard sometimes, isn't it? There, there's the listening part, but then there's actually the obeying part, and that's not always easy. But it's interesting, if we jump ahead a little bit to Galatians 5, 16, actually back a little bit, we read these words from Paul. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Well, it means if we align ourselves with the Spirit's promptings, we will exhibit his fruit. See, the reality is we have a role to play in the process. We can cooperate with him as he transforms us more and more into the likeness of Christ, or we can ignore his promptings. We can ignore his guidance. Scripture says we can quench the Spirit. That's in 1 Thessalonians 5. So I, I love our kids. I love spending time with our kids. One of my least favorite places to go is Costco. So one of the last times I went to Costco, my son wanted to push the cart. So all of us parents probably knows how the story is going to end, right? My son wanted to help push the cart. So it very quickly, our trip to Costco unraveled into sort of a, a tug of war between how, how much force to use with the cart, which direction to go in, how to avoid the heels of the people in front of us. So that was our trip to Costco. But often I think our relationship with Jesus can sort of unravel into a tug of war between which direction are we going in? Who gets to make the rules? Who gets to push the cart? Right? See, the truth is if we don't give the spirit reign in our lives, if we're, if we're living in a habitual state of rebellion, disobedience, that will become evident in us. We won't manifest his fruit to the same extent. We need to keep in step with him and respond in obedience when he speaks. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stirred up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stirred up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. We want to be full of the spirit, don't we? Yeah. Well, in order to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, finally, we recognize that the fruit of the spirit it's not just about us. Do I ever need to be reminded of that sometimes? The fruit of the Spirit is not just about us. See, the Holy Spirit, he produces fruit in us so that we can reflect Jesus and impact others for him. He doesn't transform us just so we can feel good about ourselves. As, as nice as that would be, there's more to it than that. John 15, 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might do what? Go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. See, the fruit of the Spirit evident in us, it, it leads to others encountering Christ, receiving his Spirit, being transformed in the process. Good fruit, it's evidence of a good God. And it's evidence that needs to be shared with others. As he transforms us, he calls us out. He calls us out. So the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's not something we strive 
to obtain. It's something that flows naturally out of our relationship with Jesus. It's a product of us abiding in him and allowing him to shape us more and more into his likeness. So Corrie Ten Boom, she once shared a story of a moment when she faced a former jailer from her concentration camp during the Holocaust. She realized she did not have the capacity within her to forgive. And I'll close with this. She writes, He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, he said. To think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who preached so often the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed the silent prayer, Jesus I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. While into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. See, that's the fruit of the Spirit. It's supernaturally birthed in us. It's not a result of striving, but abiding in him, walking closely with him. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. God, thank you that you have declared us righteous through the work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. Thank you that we don't have to strive to earn your favor. That through your spirit, we are made new, better able to reflect you. God, when our default posture becomes striving, would you remind us of your grace? And would you call us back into life-changing relationship with you? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.